Okay. Welcome. I'm going to um, start, start us off by calling the meeting to order at 6.02 for our minute taker. Thank you all for coming. Um, on behalf of the board, we appreciate that you have joined us once again. If you're back as a repeat listener or participant. There are um, handouts over here on the, on the counter of tonight's presentation and the past presentation if you need any other reference um, material that is referenced in tonight's presentation. Is there any public comment at this time? All right, I'll turn it over. We'll start our presentation. That's all yours. <laughs> All right, so for those that I haven't met, I'm Patrick Green, superintendent for MAUSD. And how is this for volume? Can you hear me okay? Or do you want me to use the mic? Yeah. Uh, if at any point this doesn't work, let me know, and I can start using the mic. I feel like we're small enough and close enough right now that this is probably okay. So we're going to talk about the budget tonight. And, and thought it would be helpful before we jump into the numbers and the nitty gritty to talk a little bit about um, our vision our schools and some of the documents that kind of help, uh, helped me write what I would see as our vision that I think um, connect to those documents. And then we'll jump into the budget details and, and all the fun stuff in there. So the three, the three sort of pieces of information that I think help inform what we would say is our vision for our schools or what I have tried to capture as a vision for our schools tonight for me, came from the community values that have surfaced this fall as we've been talking about uh, sort of future planning with our facilities and things of that nature. Also, the MAUSD ends policy. Obviously, I'm not going to read through this, and all the slides are in your packet that you have. And our strategic plan goals. So when I think about the, the values that surface through our community engagement, when I think about the ends uh, policy, and I think about the strategic plan goals, that helps me to sort of put in, in sort of common, simple terms what might a vision for our schools be. So as I think about it, I think about our schools as places where all students achieve at high levels academically, a place where all students are physically, socially, and emotionally <coughs> healthy and happy, a place where all students feel welcome and safe <coughs> in our schools and in our community, and a place where our schools and community partner closely to provide students with flexible and authentic learning opportunities. I also think about a place where innovative, collaborative, and highly engaging learning happens in clean, light-filled, modern, energy-efficient, well-maintained facilities. Where educators feel personally and professionally satisfied by their work in stable, well-staffed, uh, in stable, well-staffed schools with a robust system of support, both for professionals and for students. So that was sort of my attempt to tie all those pieces of information together to say in simple terms, this is what I imagine for our schools when I think about a vision. So that then comes, raises the question, where and how does this budget support that vision? So the budget that you're going to see maintains a strong multi-tiered system of supports, keeping the emphasis on core instruction. It also maintains programming for students. There are no programmatic reductions in this budget. It maintains resources that support the MAUSD strategic plan, and there are copies of the strategic plan on the table over there by Don. It also maintains a robust facilities budget so that there's funds to continue to make improvements to our facilities that are so desperately needed. And it maintains staffing to provide in-house, job-embedded professional development to our educators. So this budget accomplishes these things while hitting our financial target that we'll get into. Um, and all of these, I think, support this vision that I've laid out here, building off of those three pieces of information. Maybe that's a decent place to stop. Hear any thoughts, comments, questions? Is there anything in this vision absent? Or anything here that you think doesn't belong? Great, thank you very That's good, because <laughs> that's what we're working to achieve. 
So as we dig into the FY21 projected budget, I think it's important to start with what the target for this budget was. So the financial target was, at the time, using our conservative estimates for equalized pupil. Now we have real numbers for equalized pupil that may still change slightly, but they would only change ever so slightly. And those numbers come to us from the state. We don't set those numbers. And using those equalized pupil estimates don't exceed the spending threshold which has been set by the state. So this budget accomplishes the target that was set. I think enrollment, so enrollment plays a role in our equalized pupil count, which is a deriving factor in building a budget. So I always like to start the conversation about budgets with enrollment. I think that sets the context. So this is a slide that's been in many presentations. You can see that the, the lowest recorded enrollment for MAUSD in the last 25 years was FY19, so last year. And as we forecast out, we're projecting that we have not seen yet the lowest enrollment. So suggesting our trajectory is still downward <coughs> in terms of overall enrollment, which has a significant impact on our equalized pupil. So that also informs class size, right? So there's a relationship between our total enrollment and where our class sizes are. And where we, where we keep our class sizes has a direct impact on our programming as well as being able to meet the financial challenges that we face when we're building a budget. So these are the class size guidelines that have been established and these are built from education quality standards which are basically a set of rules created by the state to help be sure that we're compliant with statute. So those rules, the education quality standards, suggest that these are the class sizes that we ought to be striving for. And so what you're going to see on the next slide takes this optimal average range column and puts that side by side with our actual average class size across the grade bands. So there's the optimal average range that we were just talking about. And these are, over the past four years, what the average class size for those bands have been in MAUSD. So as we project forward to FY21, we can see that our class sizes in our K2, 3, 4, and 5, 6 are right, in, right within the optimal average range of our class size guidelines. And at 712, we're under that range in optimal average um, from the EQS. Part of that is the, the challenge in reducing classrooms at the secondary level is it has the potential to reduce programs at the secondary level. So it's a little more complicated to, to sort of make staffing adjustments downward in response to fewer students while maintaining the kind of breadth and depth of programming that we think is important at a secondary school. So that's that constant juggle. Uh, Shannon and I have talked, I don't know how many times, about how do we navigate that, that challenge. And that will continue to be a challenge uh, for the foreseeable future. So there's been some question about, so people in the past have found this somewhat useful, but really want to dig into what are the actual class sizes in our schools? <clears throat> so this next slide helps to articulate that a little bit. And I want to point a few things out here. So in meeting the financial target for this budget, this is the current number of classrooms at each of our five elementary schools. This shows the projected number of classrooms at those same schools for next year. You can see that this shows a reduction of a classroom at Beeman, an increase of a classroom at Bristol, Lincoln staying consistent, and a reduction of a classroom at Moncton and at Robinson. So when we look at what that does to both the average and the range, because the range also seemed important, people were concerned about a class that has lots and lots of students in it. So this shows for the current year, the class that has the fewest number of students in it and the class that has the most number of students in it across each of our schools. <coughs> So when we look at this range as a school district, our smallest class is eight, our largest class is 25 at our elementary schools. 
so our range is 8 to 25, which is a pretty wide range. When we look at the impact of the average class size, <clears throat> we can see that range for the average for those schools. So this is all classrooms in each school. It ranges from 15 to 20, which is a relatively wide range. And when we look at the impact of those class, uh, classroom shifts that we talked about here, uh, so the increase in one place, the decrease in three of the schools, and the other remaining constant, we can see this range now changes. So across the district, this range is now 12 to 21 versus 8 to 25. So a greater consistency in what actual class sizes are across all of our schools. When we average those out school by school, the average range now closes to 16 to 19 <coughs> across our schools. <coughs> High school gets a little more complicated, so I want to pause here for a moment to try and answer any questions or offer any clarity. Yeah. Oh, um, do you have information on um, percentages <coughs> of students on free and re reduced lunch and or IEPs? Um, because I think class size is important as are the needs. Uh, you know, you could have a class of 15 that's... It's a problem in a, in a class of 25 that's easy. Right. Yeah. So I have... Yeah. I can get you pretty close from a district perspective what those percentages are. Uh -huh. That's not here class by class, but I can tell you as building principals are working to build classrooms and uh, they're looking at many, many factors that they're trying to balance. So if there are two, three, four classrooms, for example, building principals and working with teachers are really working to make sure there's a balance in those classrooms. Um, balancing gender, balancing number, balancing need, uh, multiple factors that go into that. So that, that doesn't necessarily mean that there might not be a particular grade at a, at a particular school that has sort of an abnormally low or high need. Uh, but as a district, we are, and Katrina may be able to put 38% free reduced lunch. Uh, and the percent of our students that are on um, special education plans, IEPs, Katrina, uh, Susan, Around you can correct 14, me, about 13, 14, 14, 14 percent. Yeah. Which is, so those are, so the 13 to 14 percent is pretty much the norm. Like I think that's the typically in a school system, that's what might be expected. But yeah, nationally it's around 12 percent. Nationally around 12, so we're right in the ballpark there. Uh, and the 38 percent free reduced lunch ranges significantly around the state. Um, locally, Addison Central historically is in the 35-ish percent range as a district. So we're, we're sort of in the neighborhood um, and being comparable with them there. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Um, are there schools in our district that are on the higher end of that and the lower end of that? Yeah, so we do have, so school by school, I think, perhaps Starsboro is the, the highest at 40, 41, and maybe Moncton yes. at the lowest? 22. 22. For free and reduced lunch. For free and reduced lunch. And I don't know that we have school by school percentage of students on IEPs. We do, but to some degree, there, there can be a high level of variability when you start getting low numbers. So we've done this exercise in the past where we've looked at elementary schools in particular and the percentage of students that are on IEPs in those buildings, and they, they, um, they can vary wildly depending on um, enrollment. Right. Okay. Right, so the lower enrolled schools, a one or two student change <coughs> is a more significant percentage shift than a higher enrolled school. Maybe a little bit of a tangent, but I grew up in a town that's similar population to the five towns here together. We had multiple elementary schools, and when the size of one got out of line, they just redrew the lines. You know, the, the, you're no longer in the such and such district, you're in. Yep. Now that we're all one big district, is that not practical on any of our schools? Similar thing with the bus routes. Is there any reason they have to be exactly town by town? Or, I mean, it seems like there's a chance to, rather than two half classrooms in one school, maybe you can shift a boundary and make a... Right. So the very complicated response to that yeah. question, right? So and a lot of it's a matter of opinion. 
the reality is we do have the flexibility now for students to attend different schools. The way that the Articles of Agreement currently read, it states that it is the intent that students attend the school in the town where they reside. That Article of Agreement can be changed by the board. There are some, some Articles of Agreement can be changed by the board, yeah. and other Articles of Agreement have to be changed by the electorate. That one can be changed by the board. So that, that is something that could be looked at in sort of that concept of, we talked about it as redistribution, redistricting, yeah. et cetera. There's some flexibility in what the board can do there. And there are pros and cons yeah. to taking that action. Yeah. And that's where it starts to get complicated. And yes to the bus routes as well. As these um, shifts in the number of classrooms are happening, I guess I would just encourage the board to ask questions around what that looks like for instruction for students. Um, we went through a similar situation a few years ago where every elementary school lost a classroom. <laughs> and I think there were some unintended potential consequences um, that were direct to students um, and not necessarily in the best interest um, as a whole. And there were adjustments that were made to compensate for that, but it felt like band-aided things to try and do what was best. So I guess I would just encourage the board to, to ask questions as to how is this going to directly impact the educational and instructional experience of the kids in all of these schools. I think to Kayla's point, so what's coming to mind for me are <coughs> The benefits, there are some challenges in various multi-grade configurations. And I think that's, as we have fewer and fewer students and we're keeping all schools open and we're having fewer staff, we are seeing more multi-grade classrooms, perhaps out of necessity than choice. In the past, we've, we've had multi-grade classrooms for a long, long time. Sometimes out of choice, sometimes out of necessity. We are starting to see more of a need to have them out of necessity as enrollment declines and we're having fewer staff for those classrooms. And so trying to figure out how do we do that in a really you know, strong way so that the instruction remains what it ought to be for students. And are we seeing so far that the model that's changed from the coaching to the interventionists, that it's been supporting that need of consolidating classrooms? In other words, you know, we, we also, that same year that we changed, uh, we had to, we lost classroom in every elementary school, we also kind of changed the way in which the classrooms operate, and so there was less, fewer hands directly interacting with the kids. Yeah. So what are we seeing as far as that's concerned? So one of the, where, where we saw some of the greatest challenge surface as we worked toward, as we made a, a reduction in classroom, which prompted a need for a multi-grade classroom, <coughs> was at Lincoln, and the support that's been provided both last year and ongoing this year is coming from primarily coaches and coordinators helping to provide some instructional strategies and, and provide that support. And we are seeing a great deal of progress in that area, and I would say successes. And there are still some challenges that we continue to work through. Um, but so thinking, tying those two questions together, I think it's those systems of support that are now in place that hadn't been before that put us in a position to be able to make those things work the best that they can. So that's just sort of a quick anecdotal. Katrina may, able to, may be able to speak more about um, some of the other benefits that we're seeing, but we are more and more now what we're hearing from educators is appreciation for the support that these systems that we now have in place can offer them, whether it's the district-wide in-service that's delivered by these folks that, that develop expertise in these areas, so thinking about coordinators and coaches. In addition to coordinators and coaches, classroom teachers stepping up and for delivering professional development during these in-services, which then translates into ongoing support in the classroom in a really job-embedded way um, to follow up from these in-service treatments. So I think we are seeing a great deal of benefit from those changes. The student outcomes piece, we have glimmers of that. That piece takes time. Like that takes years to really start to see the significant shift in student outcomes that we anticipate seeing and that we want to see. Yeah. 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 Ye
And then will we have some kind of data that will point to the positive feedback that you're seeing? And, and I know eventually we'll have data regarding student outcomes. Mm -hmm. But when can we expect to see some data on, on this? Yeah, so, we're, so we do collect anecdotal sort of stories along the way, which I think help tell a lot about the successes that we're seeing. And I do think at some point we may want to consider uh, a more formal survey. Um, now that things are, have been in place for a little while and they're starting to work a little bit more as we've anticipated they would work. Um, so survey data comes to mind for me as something that we need to give some real thought to. But the survey's not created at this point. about what the principals have to say about what's on that slide. Sure, so these conversations happened <coughs> sort of over the course of months, and even some of these conversations stemmed back to last year as we were looking at enrollment and text. So the conversations have been ongoing for quite a while. Um, and I think there's sort of a mix of, and we have principals here, and they're free to share what their, what their perspective was on this. Um, how I would summarize it is, um, <coughs> sort of a, a wish we had, didn't have to do this and that we had enough students that we could sustain what we had, et cetera, combined with the recognition that, yeah, so Robinson, for example, as one of the schools losing in classroom, is currently this year smaller than Lincoln was two years ago. Declining enrollment is real, and principals recognize that, and they've had conversations with staff, and staff, I think, recognize that. So I don't think it comes as a surprise or a shock, though it still feels somewhat unfortunate that we're in the position. So that, that's my summary. There, there's at least one elementary building principal here, sort of scanning to see if there are others. And you were sort of on the receiving end of another classroom teacher this year. Um, so in a different in a different position than maybe some others are. So we were we were very happy and felt uh, informed and involved in the process. To and we certainly looked at these numbers through an equity lens. So I'm Tom Buzzle, the interim principal at Just the one else. Um, I think we, uh, we're happy to work with the central office and in this case arriving at what felt like an equity world for our school across, uh, across the district. And it's, a, it's a range that we're, uh, was of course very well received in the work And I think we've, we've done a lot of work as an admin team to, to be thinking about the system as a whole and looking at it through the lens of equity throughout the system. And when we have, when we have a range of eight to 25, and averages 15 to 20. Everyone sees that and recognizes the challenges that creates. And when we can when we can keep class sizes reasonable and bring them much closer to the same, we're, we're everyone's having everyone is in a position um, to work with the same resources to strive for the same outcomes for students that we're working toward everywhere. Uh, so I think that concept of equity is recognized as we make these changes. And I heard um, through eliminating the classrooms that doesn't necessarily mean that you're that we're losing teachers. Is that that's correct? True. And we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. Um, right. So. <coughs> When we get into the numbers, You're we've been able to make all of these sorry. changes. <laughs> um, so we've been able to make all of these changes without a rip. So no one has been essentially fired to achieve this. But we have taken advantage of attrition that has been created. So in October, the board offered um, the career change incentive to unlimited numbers of people and and fortunately we were able to uh, so there were two elementary classroom teachers that took advantage of that those are the two elementary classroom teacher positions that are not being filled right so we have three elementary schools each with one less classroom next year 
one of those three goes to Bristol, which leaves a net reduction of two elementary classroom teacher positions. And we have two elementary classroom teachers taking the career change. No one had to be rift to achieve that. I'll fast forward quickly to the high school. You're gonna see, so classes equals sections at the high school. You're gonna see sections for 1920 and sections for 2021 the same in all subject areas except for science and social studies. We reduce by six sections, which more or less is one classroom teacher. So it happened that actually in science and social studies, we had two classroom teachers take the career change in each of those subject areas. One of those were not failing in science and one of those were not failing in social studies. We also had uh, some support staff that have submitted their, their resignation effective the end of this year, um, retiring. We're taking advantage of not filling those. We also had, uh, I'd have to go back to the numbers, they're on another slide. We had a number of support staff and some professional staff that left post-budget development last year, so didn't return for the school year we're in, that we took advantage of, we didn't fill. All told, 12.25 positions reduced, and no one was ripped, and no one was fired. <laughs> but I think that sets the stage for us, so to, to get our budget where it is, which we'll dig into the numbers soon, required effectively eliminating 12.25 positions. And, and I don't see that being any different <coughs> next year and the year after and the year after. If it's different, it's because there are more positions that we will have to find to reduce than what we did this year. So let's look at secondary class sizes. So same idea, I tried to sort of give you as best we can an apples to apples comparison, secondary and elementary. Number of sections this year, number of sections next year, and as I noted before, social studies and science are the only two areas where there's a reduction of sections planned. Range of the class sizes this year and next. Some of this is a result of the number of students that are anticipated to be enrolling in various sections, right? So this isn't 47 sections of the same English class. This is 47 sections of a whole variety of English classes. And the high school does the best they can to project the number of seats needed in each of those various classes. So some of that uh, is reflected here, and some of what you can see here is the, the recognition that there, there really ought to be a minimum number of students for a section to run. So the idea of having sections of three or four is quite costly. Uh, so to, to try and run programs that have better enrollment, while maintaining programming, so keeping that breadth of programming is the goal. Shane and I have talked, she knows that's what she's striving for next year. And you can see here, for the most part, so as we think about the impact on the average class size, so science and social studies is where we see the reduction. <coughs> average class size in science goes from 17 to 18, <coughs> social studies from 17 to 18. So minimal impact on the average class size. And the range, again, the high end of the range really isn't changing, but the low end of the change is coming up a little bit. Yes, so this is middle and high school. Okay. These figures represent seven through 12. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One for the low and in English and music and language, for example. Yeah. Is that, for the most part, like an AP class, for example? Can you speak up? I didn't hear Sorry, I was wondering where you see only three students in an English class, for example. Can we assume that's an upper level class? 
or not necessarily? And if it is an upper level class, what options other than a physical classroom at Mount Abe do students have to attain that? Um, you know, in other words, I would hate to see us say, well, there's only three kids in AP English, therefore don't offer AP English. Rather, there's only three kids in this physical building taking it. What other ways can they get that opportunity? Yep. I mean, if that's our reality. So I'm just wondering if that is what the reality is. <coughs> I'll let Shannon respond. Um, so no, I think you would tend to think that way, but it actually doesn't work out that way. So the classes that tend to be lower enrolled are a really specialized elective offering within that particular content area okay. that in I, what I believe happened, kids registered, a number of kids dropped down in the fall um, during our drop ad period and it was kind of like, well, what do you do with those kids and the teacher afterwards? And for a number of classes, the kids were seniors, they weren't gonna have the opportunity to take said class again, uh -huh. so it, it ran. Um, if the situation were that it was an AP class with the, that few kids, you know, three, four, even seven kids, um, there are a number of AP offerings that we can provide for kids through uh, virtual high school, which is a real teacher on the other end of the computer um, that they can work through and they can also um, use their dual enrollment vouchers if they're seeking a, a college level class. And <coughs> the high schools in this community, kids can also take a class at Middlebury College for free. They can audit a class for free at Middlebury College. And it goes on their transcript not as a not credit bearing, like they can't transfer that credit into a school, but it would show up on their transcript that they took a Middlebury College level course. And part of the challenge that, that as we're talking about class sizes here, part of the challenge that we, I think we, we're going to have to wrestle with is you know, education quality standards which suggests that secondary class sizes are okay to be larger than elementary class sizes, and for us, our reality is our secondary class sizes are smaller than our elementary, right? So that, that's something to be contended with. I don't know what the solution is, but that, that's a challenge that we know is ahead of us. Hurt? Yeah, so um, uh, you know, I, I totally get the issue of our class size being small. Uh, it can't be uh, real cost effective. Uh, I guess, well, I have one question. We mentioned it's not all AP. Uh, what are the classes that are going to be dropped? And do you have any concern by moving to you know virtual courses, Middlebury, whatever, that you're going to see fewer kids enrolled in those classes? Yeah. So Shannon and I have talked briefly about this, and, and we're not seeing, we're not anticipating a programmatic impact. I'll let Shannon talk more specifically about the details of how that's uh, how that is what we're anticipating. Um, but we don't see this, like, there isn't necessarily going to be a science class that is currently offered that won't be offered next year as a result of this. I don't know if you want to elaborate, Shannon. Yeah, um, so earlier this fall, um, I worked with the teacher leaders to do a program audit of all their classes and to look at historical enrollment in a class. So I'll just make up a class, right? So underwater basket weaving has been offered in art for five <coughs> years and Two years it ran with 10 kids or 11 kids, and then there weren't enough kids to fill it. They couldn't fit it in their schedule, <coughs> even though you know maybe 15 or 20 kids signed up for it. So they spent some time looking at their historical data to say there appear to be some courses that are no longer relevant or interesting to our students based on some of the things that we've brought in that are new, maybe more relevant, more engaging, more exciting. So. The only time that we're really, I think I'm anticipating classes not running is really a scheduling piece where a number of kids can't get it in because it's a, a specific class and it's offered at the same time as three other classes that are also in high demand. So perhaps it wouldn't run. Um, we're also working with teacher leaders and our guidance department to really think creatively about how we offer classes to offer them on a rotating basis. Like, especially AP classes where you want those numbers to be higher, that you would offer them every other year so every kid would have an opportunity to take every single one if they wanted and not have the potential for those classes to be offered all in the same block, but as long as they planned it out, they would be able to fit them all in. And then that helps bolster the numbers in those classes. Okay. 
that, that this is um, slightly going back to 12.25 teachers you said okay. they were fortunate yeah. enough to to uh, that's actually <laughs> but you said I don't see anything different next year or the year after that. Are you referring to the number of positions that would have to be reduced? Right. When you said that. So I in just wanted to make sure I understood. Yes. Yeah, so it's sort of in anticipation of continued declining uh, equalized pupil counts and continued increase in expenses and uh, the sort of cost adjustments that will need to be made to continue to put forth budgets that keep us under the spending threshold because I anticipate staying under the, the spending threshold to be something that will be expected of me as superintendent for years to come. Um, and so I, I raised the point of the number of positions it took to meet this year's budget target as an example of what we could possibly expect for the future in terms of the number of positions given what we anticipate our financial value. Or you would have to find, the district would have to find another way to save a comparable amount. Right, exactly. Or find that pot of gold somewhere that solves our revenue challenge. Um, it grows in trees. Exactly, right. right. I'm still looking for the tree. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, can you kind of put that number of, of the 12 and a half? 12 and a quarter. Yeah. 12 and a quarter. So what does that represent as a percentage of of kind of our district-wide employment volume? Good question. Um, <laughs> Three percent? Just sort of kind of pulling it off the top of my head, thinking about 300 plus employees. That's 12 and a quarter. I'd have to really crunch the numbers sure, yeah, to we'll do it, but in, yeah. Yeah, just thinking about um, I think I, I appreciate this idea that people haven't been ripped, that this is happening. So I think there's been a lot of like strategic strategy to make that happen. Um, but I also feel like that's still a lot of staff. And I don't think anyone's not saying that, but when I see support staff, that looks like a lot of different things to different teachers and students and some of the Students who are struggling the most, experience trauma. I see the support staff are like the only person they can connection. So I don't want to, you know, I, I want to recognize not being ripped is really good. And that's that's a lot of staff. It's like three percent of our staff is a district, and so even special educator, like that's. I just think of the most vulnerable students, <coughs> those particular staff. Sometimes the most yeah. historically. So I wonder how how are we thinking about filling that void? Um, Specifically, yeah. And let me just let me just stop there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's complicated to talk about how we plan on filling that void because the reality is there are a number of different. There's a range of impacts from the different people in the different positions that are here. Um, to some extent, the system of support that we're building helps to fill that void. Um, and to another extent, there's a the reality that we have fewer students our percentage of students identified as being in need isn't necessarily changing, so the actual number of students in need um, is also decreasing. So we can absorb some of those reductions because of that as well. That's sort of a really broad strokes um, kind of perspective on it. And some of, some of these things, so if there's, so if a person chose to retire and we weren't gonna fill that position, uh, or that FTE, I would even say, but they happen to be working with a student whose need is going to continue, and that student needs to have that support, we're going to move someone internally to that position from somewhere else to make sure that need is covered. So, so be really clear about our prioritized need and making sure that those needs are met. And obviously students on IEPs whose IEP calls for support, for sure they're going to get it. We're going to make sure they get that. We may have a student move in six weeks from now, we may have five students move in six weeks from now, each of them that needs some high level of support. And whether we have it in the budget or we don't have it in the budget, we're gonna meet that, the need of those students. That's the reality of, of how this works. Um, and, and we have to adjust as we go along. Thanks. I forgot 
I wonder if you could uh, maybe Shannon to, to talk about um, the personalized learning program at Mount Abraham and beyond and what your hopes are for that work um, as reflected in the proposed budget and beyond. I can sort of do the broad strokes, then if you want to talk some specifics about what's happening at Mount A, that, that'd be great. So for me, I'm thinking about, we, I think we need to continue to find ways to create personalized opportunities for students uh, across the board. So I think historically, uh, <coughs> we've had a relatively small number of students or percentage of students engaged in, in personalized learning in really intensive ways. I think we need to continue to find ways to do that, and we need to grow opportunities for personalization across the, not just at Mount A, but into elementary schools. I think the foundation for personalization starts with uh, a strong proficiency-based system, so that we're focusing on what it is we want our students to learn. When we're crystal clear about what we want our students to know and be able to do, we can then be flexible in how, what path they take to get there and demonstrate they have that. <coughs> So uh, we're, we're already underway in developing the understanding of, personal, of proficiency based learning in our elementary schools, which can become then the foundation for personalized learning down the road. At Mount Abe, they've been doing work, a lot of great work for a number of years in proficiency based learning. So have that foundation really well established and are continuing to grow in the ways in which they offer personalized opportunities. And that's where I'll turn it over to Shannon and talk about ILOs and GLOs and some of those things. So there's a number of different ways that you can access personalized learning in the high school. Um, in middle school, a number of the teams are working through negotiated curriculum at times, where it's very student-driven based on interest, and they uh, put them in their personalized learning plan. Um, at the high school level, uh, we have two people that are our personalized learning department um, who oversee that. So they see independent learning opportunities for kids there's something that they're really interested in, a topic, a language, could be anything, and they're going to explore that on their own, kind of under the guidance of a teacher. We have guided learning opportunities for any student who wants to take that risk to do some independent learning, but needs a little more support along the way, um, and maybe a little instruction here and there, as opposed to the others are much more self-directed, the independent learning. Um, our work-based learning program is really growing, where we have kids going out into the community, um, either for job shadows to see if there's something that they're interested in, or something uh, more long-term um, in their earning transferable skill scores and credit in those areas, and we are working to grow that so that they can earn, you know, I'm thinking of a, a student in particular who spent a significant amount of time at one of the hemp farms and learn so much. So uh, the next piece for us as a school is like, how can we link that learning so that he can earn some of his science proficiency credits or maybe some math because there's like a business component. Um, so those things are all still happening. The difference was a number of years ago there was a personalized learning department and it was um, a, gr a, a larger group of teachers. So the two that are there now and some others from various departments and what we've done is we've built the capacity City within all the departments. So one of the teacher's teaching blocks could be a personalized learning block where a kid could be, or a number of students could be working on independent learning opportunities, guided learning opportunities. Um, maybe that's where they're taking a virtual high school class. Um, and then we also have proficiency-based learning labs. So if a kid didn't quite earn all the proficiencies they needed to get credit for a class towards graduation, they don't necessarily have to take that whole class again. They can work with a teacher in that content area to just work on the proficiencies that they missed so that they can still access other things in their schedule. So you have uh, teachers in, in all the four yes. subject areas who are available to um, sponsor personalized learning graduation credit? Yeah, yeah we build it into, into teachers' schedules based yep. on you know, whatever the course, so we're just starting this process now. So the course requests go in, we figure out how many, you know, sections do we need of that, how many sections do we want of personalized learning each block in the different areas that spread those out, and then kids sign up and they work with the personalized learning coordinator about what it is they want to do, what's their plan. Um, there, there's a very cool, um, personalized learning period right now with one of our social studies teachers 
and it's a number of students exploring different languages from around the world and cultures. Um, and he happens to be, I, I call him, he's like quintilingual. Quint I don't even think that's a word. He speaks so many languages. Um, so it's really fun to go in there and see, and that's like through really personalized learning. I think it's also worth noting the relationship with the career center. So students can, through their PLP, make connections to what they're studying at the career center, and the relationship between Mount Ave and the career center in terms of the development of understanding of proficiency-based learning and connecting what's happening at the Career Center to the proficiencies that we're setting for you know, our proficiency-based graduation requirements, that relationship gets stronger and stronger every year um, and is very much sort of in the spirit of personalized learning as well. So I know we're about halfway through our time. I haven't talked any numbers yet, which is probably going to be something people are interested in. I just, I just, uh, are, are we to... Um, Interpret from the slide in front of us that <clears throat> there are no increases or reductions in numbers of interventionists, uh, coaches, coordinators, any correct. other kind of position. Yes, that's correct. <coughs> So this, this page sort of summarizes the programmatic impact. As we talked about, some, some average class sizes in, in elementary schools will increase in some places, but decrease in others. The average, range, average and range of class sizes becomes more consistent. Configurations may need to change to reflect the reduction in some, in some schools or <laughs> the classroom. And that does create some challenges sometimes, so there may be a need for teachers to continue to develop their ability to deliver uh, instruction to multi-grade classrooms. Math has been the, the most challenging um, sort of subject specifically to deliver that, that multi-grade instruction to. And we've been working really hard with our coaches and coordinators to provide support to teachers to develop that ability. And we're seeing some really great, um, really great success stories as a result of that collaboration that's been happening. At Mount Abe, again, average class sizes are gonna go up one or two students in those uh, two courses, two uh, subject areas where there are gonna be a reduction. Uh, but there is no impact on the breadth or, or depth of the science and social studies program offerings. And overall, this does keep that high level of support for students who struggle, and it keeps um, that system, of, that multi-tiered system of support intact for teachers and students. Just a question on the bottom. Um, I know we're having conversations about instruction, which is last time. I'm wondering, what, what do you have in place to evaluate it? That seems like a... Can uh, you speak up? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, I'm sure. Over here. <coughs> no, it's okay. <coughs> Pardon my cold. I'm wondering what the district has in place to evaluate you know, this idea that we have a high level support for students who are struggling. Like, how do we know that? Um, so what's the data behind that? Um, we have multi-tier system of support for teachers and students. Like, that's an awesome, exciting statement, but I think I want to push to say, What's the data? Do we think that data is giving you know, for us to evaluate that? Because I think that's a, is it, is it working really well in this classroom? Is it working not so well in this elementary school? Is it, that I want to sort of poke at that and see what's being, data being collected and maybe what's the goals too. So I, <coughs> I think, I think that the idea that there are some, some places where it's working better than others, that's true and that's the nature of any sort of systemic change that's happening. When I think about what's the data that's collected and I'm thinking about students who struggle, the, our, our ability and our practice of progress monitoring students who struggle that are receiving support from professional interventionists when several years ago they might have been receiving that support from a, a less or untrained support staff member, um, we know much more practically now <coughs> Uh, what progress students who struggle are or are not making, and our ability to make mid-course corrections based on our continued evaluation of that data uh, is much improved, and what we're seeing as a result of that are greater <coughs> improvements for students who struggle through that progress monitoring data that happens in an ongoing way. And so, in particular, special educators and interventionists are really dialed into that progress monitoring data and classroom teachers are evolving in their ability to progress monitor as sort of uh, targeted interventionists during wind time and things like that. So we're getting, we're getting much, much better at looking at data and using data to drive that instruction and drive that intervention. And that is translating into results for kids. Thank you.
Is there a way to get student and parent feedback in that week? Sure, I think there's a way to do that. I think it would be a survey of some sort to, to get the feedback on that. Yeah. Um, I think we talked about this, and Don maybe can clarify for me the feedback we gave to Patrick when we saw our ENDS monitoring report back in October, I guess, where we asked for uh, some different ways to evaluate students receiving support services, for example, beyond the statewide assessments. Or, and I think we also asked about student and family feedback. Um, and I think that we could do better at determining you know, what that looks like. Um, but we did ask that question for future reports. Is that True, yes. and, we, and, and, and we did we did talk as a board about um, taking to some time together to have a conversation about the ends, and that's where I think um, we get more to what how we could see it in different ways, and wondering and having the conversation with Patrick about what what the values we've heard and how do we see those in the report when it comes. So um, <coughs> the board has specifically asked for more time to, to talk about the ends instead of just when we get a monitoring report. But hopefully that kind of information, you know, would be captured in that, in that report. Um, just following up on, on, on that, that topic, I, I confess, I'm really discouraged um, by our current situation. Um, I, I totally understand the, the cost pressures that, that we're under and the decline in enrollment. Um, but I, you know, the gap between what we're able to offer in terms of education quality, and we've got outcomes and inputs, you know, and uh, you know, we've got the data, the data is there. But they seem to show hey, that that we're really not doing well, and it's a huge gap. Uh, Patrick, I want to acknowledge uh, your forthrightness in saying that. I, I've been around these schools for <laughs> too long, maybe, and you're the first person that I think has acknowledged that, um, and I think that's really important. To, you can't do anything about something. If you my concern is right now that we don't have, you know, we don't have a plan to deal with that that I think is going to be effective. I know what you said in response to, to the report and relying on the multi-tiered systems of support, instructional coaching, strategic plan. I, I, I just, I, I have to tell you, I don't think it's going to cut I'd love to hear more, uh, but I don't think it's going to cut it given where we're at now and where we need, really need to come uh, to get to. Uh, and the problem is, you know, you have these, these fiscal issues that obviously, you know, are, are real constraints. But I can see, you know, if we're not really making visible improvement in the quality of education, you know, maybe because of these constraints, you know, you're just going to start this cycle of, well, people, you know, people don't want to pay for it. Anything, they don't pay taxes. And then you have people say, well, you know, we're not really getting a good quality education, you know, what's the, what's the point? <coughs> uh, and so it's very, very discouraging. And I encourage the board. The board's got a great policy, I think, in terms of uh, educational quality and, and core subjects. I think you're trying. I, I just don't see it getting to where we need to be within a time frame that I think is I personally acceptable to a lot of folks. I can't speak to everyone. I, you know, I'm sorry that's a rant. Uh, but um, I, I, okay, here's the question. What is there in the budget uh, that will directly impact our ability to improve the quality of education to where we need to be? So this is where I would say again, the supports that remain in place for our multi-tier system of supports. So I think 
Thank you for acknowledging that I have said actually twice now in two ANS monitoring reports that we are, we cannot say that we are meeting, uh, I can't say that, um, that I'm in compliance with the ENDS policy when overall our scores on multiple measures are plus or minus 50% of our students proficient. When you disaggregate for a lot of subgroups, the, the gap grows considerably larger. Um, I can't in good conscience say, yes, that is what we are able to achieve. That is what we can expect our students to produce for results. We can do better. We have to do better by behaving differently. As we face difficult financial times, we can't do less of the same things we've done for years and years and years and think that that is going to be our path to changing those outcomes for kids. That's why we made so many changes that we did a couple of years ago to build systems that were absent prior, despite the fact that we had to reduce almost $2 million in our expenses while doing that. Despite our financial realities, we have to continue to make decisions and point toward improved outcomes, not maintaining outcomes. For me, I think this is where we may agree to disagree. The strategic plan that nearly 50 people created that combined um, students, teachers, support staff, board members, community members, etc., that took two and a half years to write, I think is a plan to help get us where I think we agree we want to be. Um, and our multi-tiered system of support through personalized learning, et cetera, all those things that are written in that plan are what I'm investing in to get us there. Yeah, so I'd love to follow up. I, I don't see you know, specific targets in the, in, the, in the strategic plan. Maybe I just don't understand or see, uh, but I just don't see us getting there uh, in the time frame that I think is. Yeah, and those who work most closely with me can attest to this. I share in the frustration and how long it takes to make change. <laughs> That's something that I bump up against all the time. Um, my goal for the writing of the strategic plan was that it would take a year, and it took two and a half. Um, and I also acknowledge that sometimes the process is as important as the product. The process of people coming together to articulate what do we want for our students and what's our plan to get there was tremendously valuable. So to, to rush that process um, would have been a challenge as well. And I have to take that same approach sometimes when, when I recognize systems change, and I would say that changes we've made fit the description of systems change. The research is clear it's five to seven years before you see the effect of the systems change that you're making. And if we make a systems change and halfway through the first year of that change say it's not working and abandon that, we never give it an opportunity to produce the results that we think it's capable of. That's why it's the, you hear me use the, the term five years a lot. We have a five-year strategic plan. I say we need to give it five years. That's on the short side of what we might expect to see for results. Really frustrating for me, really hard for me, because there are kids sitting in our classrooms right now that need something different right now. Um, and we need to pay attention to those individuals while recognizing that as a system, it's going to take longer to get where we need to be. Caleb? Um, I don't want to get, get ahead of anyone who's got questions about this, but I really did appreciate all the detail about the specifics of the classrooms. That was something new, but just looking at the time, could we get to some of the numbers and maybe circle back? Sure. Uh, not wanting to cut anybody off. If there were some more with that, I, I would be excited to see them, or at least eager to see them. And I'm happy to stay after the presentation if folks want to stay and talk more. So we can, we can address some of those that way. So speaking of numbers, let's jump right into the numbers. So this is, this is a familiar graphic. Uh, numbers have changed a little bit as the budget has evolved. And these boxes on the side are a little bit new that explain a couple of pieces of this pie that may not be as self-explanatory. So this, is, uh, this was something that a board member saw in a different school district and thought it was a good way to represent how spending um, is sort of divvied up throughout our organization. And what you can see here, so this largest piece of the pie represents our instructional programs. And this little box describes what that means because it could be interpreted a lot of different ways. These are the salaries, benefits, professional development, tuition, I should say some of the benefits, and professional development, tuition, vocational career center, guidance, health supplies. So 
those sorts of things that you would think of as directly impacting um, sort of our overall regular education program. The reason I say most benefits is because the cost for the premium share of health benefits is included in this graphic, in this pie, piece of the pie, but the cost for the HRA expenses, um, which are a little over a million dollars, actually fit into the district administration piece of the pie because they're all sort of in that, um, they all are, are spent out of a line that's in uh, a section that more closely resembles the district admin which is also why I thought it was important to further define what this district admin slice of the pie was. As I mentioned, the HRA costs for the district, the insurance for the district, legal expenses, audit, the financial software. So next year, we have to make a significant change in our financial software. We're moving to the same software uh, throughout the state. Um, so that cost to make that shift is in here. And as well as salaries and benefits for fiscal services, district leaders, and EOPN. Those are all sort of in that, that piece of the pie that is called district admin. And then lastly, down here, this box describes the instructional support. So in that are sort of expenses that are media related, curriculum development. This is where coaches, instructional staffing, training, um, and any outside professional services fall. Then I think special ed, the school administration, food service, these all were a little more self-explanatory that I didn't think in the, the descriptors. But this kind of gives you a sense of, of all the spending in MAUSD, where to go. I wouldn't expect that you'd see this tiny print on the screen, but I'll walk through, this is in your, in your packet. This is, this is something that we sort of adapted from the South Burlington School District that really does a really nice job of walking you through from from our expenses as a school district, how do you get from there to what your tax rate in your town is going to be? And I'll just sort of briefly walk you through that. So we start with our expenditures, which are of course the same for everyone because we're a unified district. We then subtract out our local revenue and that difference gives us our education spending. We divide that by the number of equalized pupils we have and that gives us a cost per equalized pupil. Uh, that cost per equalized pupil um, is then divided by the yield that is set. And right now the yield is projected. The yield won't actually be set till sometime in the spring probably. It has in the past at times been later than that. And when we divide that cost per equalized people by the yield, that gives you your, your equalized district residential tax rate. I want to pause there for a minute because that's how far, I would back up, um, I would say that's how far we have any control. The yield is set based on the total cost, the total money needed to fund all the budgets that have passed in the state. So we have some control over the yield in controlling our spending in MNUSD, but we obviously don't control the spending in other districts, which also have a significant impact on what the yield ends up being. Also worth noting that the, the recent settlement in the healthcare is anticipated that's gonna cost a lot more so the early projection of the yield is likely to change, not in our favor in terms of what its impact on the tax rate will be. So the idea is cost will be greater, the yield then has to be adjusted so that the taxes raise more money to cover those increased costs. So more or less, this equalized district residential tax rate is sort of where our control ends as a school district. Because we then take that equalized district tax rate, and you can see it broken down by town in this little graphic below. So each town has the same equalized district tax rate, that makes sense. We all have the same education tax rate based on our spending in MAUSD. But then each town has a different common level of appraisal. That common level of appraisal is intended to, um, is intended to recognize we go. Yeah, it's intended to recognize that some towns have more recently conducted an assessment, so the value of their homes on the grand list more accurately reflect what the retail market would, would um, bear on the, on the value of their homes. So that's an attempt to adjust for that factor. We don't control that, but it has a significant impact on what your tax rate ends up being. So we take that district residential tax rate divided by the CLAs in each town, and that actually produces for you your town residential tax rate. So that just sort of helps you understand how you get from spending. And I want to point out most importantly here that what it all boils down to is 
the cost, sorry, not education spending, but the cost per equalized pupil, that figure is the most significant driving factor that's within our control on the tax rate. So higher cost per equalized pupil equals higher tax rate. Case in point, our overall spending last year to next year is a 1.45% increase. If we go back 10 years when budgets were built based on expense over expense, historically, a 3 or 4% increase in spending passed with flying colors was no problem. People didn't really think too much about that. We're at, one, we're at less than half of that. And you're going to see what the impact is, and you're going to see how close we are to the spending threshold, et cetera. Um, more so than our spending, the cost per pupil is a driving factor. Theoretically, we could decrease spending from one year to the next, and our cost per pupil could go up and would have a negative impact on our taxes. That's, that's the reality of how budgets are built now, which is very different than how budgets were built previously. Perhaps more than you ever wanted to know already about how that's all calculated, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And the state sets the <coughs> estimated uh, the uh, equalized per pupil? So the state sets, the state actually gives us our equalized pupil count. They also set the spending threshold for the for that cost per equalized pupil, and if we go over that, there's a tax penalty. Right. So we don't have control over what the equalized pupil cost is. The state tells us what it. The threshold. We have control over the per pupil cost by our spending. So we can control spending, and to an extent, which we'll get into in a little bit, we can control revenue in terms of how do we use our fund balance every year. Um, so in the end, we can control our cost per equalized pupil. We can't control where the threshold is set. We can't control the yield, except for the ways in which I already described. Uh, but there are a number of factors that are outside of our control. Kristen? And I think maybe even the bigger one is the health care piece, it seems like. Because right. I, you know I was looking at our enrollment, and until 2023, we don't get to lower than we are. Is that right? Because I'm looking at the numbers. Right, I think so. Yeah, we but could. yet, we're still projecting this need for staff reductions. <coughs> so if we actually have more students in the next few years before we have less, that tells me that right now, the biggest driver is not our lower enrollment. It's healthcare. Is that accurate? I would say that is a big driver. Um, to put or, it in perspective. Or, or there are other drivers in the, you know, I understand that in, you know, when we get to our lowest, whenever yeah. that is, um, you know, then, then that is a, even more of an impact. Right. But in the next few years, we're not at that point. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it so, isn't just declining enrollment. Right. So to, to kind of elaborate a little further on the example before about even if spending goes down, we could see an increase in the cost of equalized pupil. If equalized pupil stays flat, these other factors, you mentioned healthcare is one, there are other factors. As these other factors increase at pretty dramatic rates and our equalized pupil stays flat, we still find ourselves needing to make reductions to not go over that spending threshold. So routine 13, 14% increases in premiums in healthcare, that's a killer. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Career Center made some changes that impacted our budget by $120,000. That was a real hurt. So there, there are lots of things that are, are, I say outside of our control, and yet to some extent are, right? So we can't control health care premiums necessarily. We can control the number of employees in our district that we employ that who's, who we pay for their insurance. So there's a control aspect there. And it's a really difficult thing to control. Um, it, it's, it's a little discouraging when we think about what we can control and what we can't control. But um, <laughs> and I know it often feels like we can't control our legislature. But um, 
our school district and the, the uh, challenges we're facing around um, defining enrollment and um, what that means are not singular to our school district. It's, um, there are many school districts, especially more rural ones, that are experiencing the same thing. And I'm very curious about what you're hearing from the legislature or saying to the legislature um, about what it could do to give us some relief. I mean, there are things that the legislature could do as far as what they're counting in our budget when they calculate spending for blood people. They have, um, <coughs> there's some things the legislature could do about calculating what the threshold should be. Um, there are lots of things the legislature could be doing um, about attracting um, uh, population to rural places rather than putting all its energy into more urban places of the state. So I'm just wondering what you're hearing and saying about those things, how, sure. the, legis how the legislature might help us. I mean, I thought that, maybe we all thought that um, going to statewide health insurance was going to help us, but it certainly hasn't turned out to be the case. And I think it's, a, it's important to know there when we're talking about effectively the same pot of money and that pot of money not necessarily changing, when something like a statewide health care comes through, <coughs> there are winners and losers. Same and with the waiting study. Same with the waiting study. Same with the Act uh, 173. Same place. So there are a number of things where <laughs> there isn't more money to go around, but we're redistributing the money that exists. And in doing so, some people are winners and some people are losers in that redistribution. When I think about it from a big picture, sort of legislatively and where the state of Vermont is, and I go back to the state of the state address from the, from the governor a couple of times ago at least now, there's a realization that, at least from the governor's perspective, and I think a lot of people follow that, part of why Vermont is seeing the demographic challenges that it is which is that it's an aging state and it struggles to attract young families, some of the things that you just raised, is in part because it's, it's very expensive to live in Vermont. So there's a real cost containment message, I think, coming out of the governor's office as a mechanism to make Vermont more attractive to those young families that then either come with kids or have kids and that helps to kind of do a lot of things, puts people into the workforce, puts kids in our school systems, et cetera. When I think about that, and I hear that, and it makes sense to me, I recognize education spending plays a big role in affordability of Vermont. It's, what, somewhere close to two-thirds of our, our property taxes. So it's, it's a big factor. So the message that I think I'm hearing is Vermont's an expensive place to live. If we want to turn this demographic challenge around, we have to make it more affordable, and education has a role, it's not the only thing, but it has a role in making it more affordable. So if I think about that, and I think about the pressures we're feeling, which are real, I don't think they're unintended. I don't think it's not known that it's happening. And I think it's probably what is recognized as a necessary step to getting ultimately where we need to be to become more viable. So that's kind of where my mind goes when I think about that. Now when I think about specifically some of the conversations I've had about what can we do in the short term to help relieve some of the pressure that we're feeling, I have had conversations with legislators about specifically, in our case, and every district has a different circumstance, so that makes it hard, I think, to, to write laws that um, address everyone's concern. I think about our situation where we have a million dollars in capital um, in, in construction services for our schools. Because it's in our general fund, not as a long-term debt, those million dollars count against our spending relative to the spending threshold and the cost per equalized pupil. If that same million dollars was paid every year to a bond to do the same kind of work, that million dollars no longer counts against our cost per equalized pupil relative to the threshold. It does for tax purposes, but we don't incur, incur a penalty for exceeding the spending threshold. 
So I've had conversations with legislators about <coughs> that one change would have a significant impact on what we can do as we try to figure out how do we navigate this complicated situation of declining enrollment, increasing expenses, things like that. And it was very well received in our sort of regional uh, meeting and sounded like it was going to be brought forth um, to the legislature for some possible action. I haven't heard much more about it since then. I think it, you know things are just kind of gearing up. I feel like that's it's it's likely that something's going to come from that. And at least around the table, it felt like yeah, that seems like a, a pretty easy win-win given where we are. Now that was a relatively small number of people that reacted that way, and they had to bring it back to a larger body to take action. Who knows where it'll go from there? But that's sort of a, a way that I've advocated so far for our particular situation. And correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, but um, <clears throat> I, I saw some reporting based on the report that came out maybe at the end of last year regarding um, education spending in the state. I think it's 150 page long sort of synopsis of, and, <laughs> of, of it all. Uh, and uh, it's like, really, yeah, really, 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 really. Um, But one thing that I thought came out of that was it, it sounded like that there was actually no um, strong science behind how to calculate equalize, per equalized pupil, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And is, is that a lever of, of possible change to take into account um, a student that lives, let's say, 50 miles from a school? That, hey, like, that's cost a little bit more to get that student there. I mean, I would love to see some strong science behind these algorithms that actually really impact um, our school district and the majority of the school districts in the yeah. state. So that, that goes back to the weighting study that Nancy was talking about. And that, that was so <coughs> morality, which is a funny term to say, but that's sort of the, that was one of the aspects they were looking at to see should there be a weight to account for morality. And just as you mentioned, that the there are inefficiencies. I don't think we could disagree that there are inefficiencies in rural areas, educationally speaking, but beyond education. And so to have a weight for rurality was something that was looked at, and the, stu the weighting study was created for the legislature to take a look at and think about what do we do. So there are a lot of different, there's a lot of information in that study, as you mentioned. There are a lot of different sort of hypothetical situations that were kind of ran through and even showing in this situation, school by school or district by district, what would the impact be? And as we talked about, there isn't more money that will be divided amongst the schools. It's just a different way of looking at dividing either the same money or less money. So it creates, every scenario creates winners and losers. And that's part of what the legislature has to wrestle with. If there isn't a more money option that can make everybody winners and everybody's happy, which I don't envision being a reality, then there are going to be winners and losers, and how, how do you weigh that as you make a decision? And that's what they're sitting on. Is that, and feel free, Caleb, as I'm sort of talking about some of these things, if I'm off or you say differently, <coughs> as a legislator, jump in. Thank you. I think, I think you're summarizing it well. I, mean, I, have some more thought. I don't want to take away from this, the purpose of this meeting, but I do think it's, a, it's an area right for further discussion so <laughs> I think we're going to try to put put something together because uh, I think the specific bill you talked about that would help with construction spending I think Representative Conlon has put that forward I hope it will move uh, I would just say with the state teacher contract uh, for health care I don't think we're done I'm certainly not done trying to think of ways in which that can uh, we can try to bend the cost curve um, with that now unified block of 40,000 people all in the same healthcare contract. I won't say more about it, but I, I, I think Chris is right to identify that as just a, you know, huge cost that just keeps growing like crazy. And so um, it may not have, you know, reduced spending this year, but we, there's potential, I think, in that new structure. <laughs> Right 
So knowing we could talk for many, many, many more hours about all of these things, are we ready to move on to some more numbers? All right, so, so this is a look at a lot of numbers, and I'll kind of explain to you what's on this slide. So as, as we've been working since October, making lots of projections and trying to shore things up as we get more information, I found this useful in, in the November board meeting to sort of show, here's sort of the evolution of this budget since we started talking about it in October. What you see in red represents a change from the prior version of the budget that we reviewed. So the budget that we have here in December, you can see what it represented. At the time, we were thinking we were going to end around 455000 under the spending threshold. Several weeks later, that's now 13500 And I bet you're thinking, what happened? So here's what happened. Between December 17th and January 22nd, uh, there are a number of things that aren't captured here. They, some went up here and went down another place that kind of canceled each other out. The two really significant driving differences are A, as I sort of alluded to earlier, the Career Center tuition increase went up about 25% from what we had been budgeting, um, which for us meant an, an addition to our general fund of $120,000. But as I understand it, um, the practice had been to cover HRE costs out of a fund balance. That fund balance no longer existed. All HRA costs had to be built into the general fund. So as we were just talking about the cost of healthcare, if you didn't have any HRA costs in your general fund, and you had to then put all of those HRA costs for all of your employees in, big, big change. In addition, I think they're adding a position to expand on a popular program, uh, which is a, I don't think building trains is the term. I don't know if you know Allison as a board member. Construction technology. Um, that's, what, that's a really popular program, and based on that demand, they were they added a position to to respond to that. Is that that captured the gist of what led to the increase, Allison? As you understand it? Um, well, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> so the um, HRA was an additional hundred twenty thousand dollar hit to the Hannaford budget. And that was based on the audit of the financial status of the tech center and the auditors recommended they do that. Otherwise, we were putting ourselves at severe fiscal risk. Okay. So they're being fiscally responsible. And then um, the arbitrator's decision on teacher health care increased our budget by $51,000 that we were not anticipating. Um, and then there's some um, programmatic changes, um, but it's mostly health insurance, the HRA, and salary increases. So that all translated into a bigger dollar than what we had initially budget budgeted earlier in the fall. When we vote on, <coughs> we vote separately on the Hanover Career Center, so I'm confused as to, is it normally completely separate than ours, or is it embedded in ours? It's normally completely separate. Um, and some of those costs come from tuition that we pay to so costs come from tuition that we pay and there are some and we'll talk about that in a minute there are some payments that go on our behalf directly to the career center so there's sort of a combination of funds that that pay for that but it does require a separate voter approval which raises another interesting point right so so should the career center budget not pass and ours does we've already embedded in our budget the impact of the career center budget that was put forth. So if, if that fails and it gets put back out and it ends up being a lower budget, right, so it, it becomes a surplus for us. It doesn't necessarily help us reduce our cost to equalize people and the tax impact and everything like that. Ship has sailed, unfortunately, at that point. So it, it is interesting the way the timing of all of that, uh, how that works. How does the um, cost <coughs> Per student at Hannaford compared to um, the cost per student at other tech centers around the state? Great question. I'm not entirely <coughs> sure. Although we do have a meeting maybe in February when Dana will come, Dana's the, the tech center director, will be here to present their budget and he might be able to answer that question. But I don't have that in your phone. I don't know if Allison does. 
I'm trying to remember a thing I said <coughs> in our last meeting. Um, we're either very close to what the other tech centers around us pay regionally, um, or it costs, cost per pupil, um, or maybe just a little bit more, um, but we're not out and a huge outlier. And I'm kind of thinking, right, I think Lloyd just did some research on this. Yeah, the um, Essex Tech Center, rough numbers, is 18,000 a kid. Hannaford, 1603, I think. Right. Yeah. So it, it's the internal discussion when we got hit with this 25% increase. Well, let's just send everybody to Essex if we can save some money. Well, clearly that's not the case. It's $2,000 per student less to send them to Hannaford and keep them local and support support that local um, tech center. But we did we did go and take a look to, to be able to answer that particular question. So I, wanna, I am just sort of acknowledging the time and recognizing that some people may need to go. And again, I'm happy to stay after, but I want to try to move us along a little bit. Okay, so. Can I just make one quick point? So the way the tech center is required to calculate the number of students it has, its equalized pupil, is based on a six semester rolling average. So they're using three years of student data to give them an equalized pupil number versus we use one year, two. October two. or two years. So um, <clears throat> it's antiquated and it, it doesn't help. And, and really punitive when the program's growing. Yes, and they have 100 more mounting students this year. But that doesn't impact the number because it's a rolling three-year average. It'll catch up eventually, but it will eventually. But that's six years down the road. Mm -hmm. Even the computer's saying, "Hey, wrap this up. Let's move this along." Just a second, I think it'll pop up. So the other thing was an error, and I'll show you where on your page you'll see it. So we we made an error in reading. As we look, as you look at the revenue summary sheet, you're going to see uh, it says a state payment on behalf of to the career center or something like that. It shows up on our revenue sheet. We count, we we add, we included it as revenue, <coughs> only because that goes directly to the career center on behalf of us. It was an error that we included that as revenue. So that had a $322,000 impact on our revenue. So we had $120,000 go up in spending, and we had $322,000 go down in revenue, which on our education spending had an effect of $442,422. So that was the change from December 17 to January 20 in net spending, and this is the net effect. So that, that represents the, the driving force behind the change between the two. And thankfully, we're still under the target that we set. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll work through this pretty quickly, and then we can come back to any, because there are two scenarios at play here. The, the board has a decision to make in terms of how do we use our fund balance from the prior year. <coughs> our fund balance, working in round numbers, is about 750000 in total that was audited from FY19. We have some say in what we do with that in terms of how it impacts next year's budget. So this scenario assumes we use the entire 750,000 of that fund balance, which from my perspective is not best practice. Because as soon as we can't sustain 750,000, it's a decrease in revenue for us. So when we have opportunities to decrease what we carry forward into the next year, while getting a budget that we think will pass voter approval, it's advantageous for us to do so. This scenario doesn't do so. Um, you can see this scenario has us increasing cost per equalized pupil by 3.76%, and it creates a 2.72% increase in its spending. Both scenarios, because their spending is the same, stays at a 1.5% increase. <coughs> What's interesting, if you look at FY18, several years ago, you compare that spending to now, that's not a very large change over four years. <clears throat> that's an average of less than a percent a year over the last four years in spending. So I think that's evidence of being fiscally responsible and the effect is still increasing cost per equalized pupil. So if we use the entire fund balance, 
Our cost of equalized pupil is 18575 As we know, that's the driving factor. And it's a 3.76% increase for equalized <coughs> pupil. We'll come back to what that means for a tax rate. If we use 500,000 of the 750 and we put the other 250 into our capital reserve fund in anticipation of facilities needs that we know we have, and I would also add in anticipation of our best guesses in terms of what the new HRA costs are going to be, right? So our thinking is if we put this 250 into a capital reserve fund and our projections are off on those healthcare costs, we can go to the 250 that we put in to help address any variance from what we're projecting and what our actuals are. So it's a little bit of a safety net given the challenge in really dialing in healthcare costs especially as we change programs, and, and we're currently in a program where we anticipate seeing the greater cost to the district coming in the second half of a calendar year, and then the new program, the greater cost to the district coming in the first half of a calendar year. So that second half of a calendar year high cost and a first half calendar year high cost for us lands in the same fiscal year. So that is something we anticipate, and it's hard to really know exactly what it's gonna be, but we know we better be prepared for something. This would help us be prepared for that. This pushes that up to a 4.71% increase for equalized pupil. And our edge spending goes a little higher because our revenue isn't as high because we're not putting as much into the revenue from our reserve fund and keeps our spending, as I said, the same. And that's an $18,746.76 um, cost for equalized pupil. And I'll bring you back to this scenario. This scenario here assumes we put the 250 into the reserve fund. If we put the 250 in the reserve fund, we're under by 13,511. If we don't put the 250 into the reserve fund, we're under by 250 more than that. So that's the control that the board has on how far under the spending threshold we want to be and how we want to make sure that we account for some variability in our health care costs. My recommendation is we put the 250 into the reserve fund in part because the budget target was <coughs> stay under the spending threshold and by the skin of our teeth, <coughs> understandably, this, this does do that for us by $10 a kid or so. Sure. Uh, by uh, reserve fund, do you mean the capital reserve fund? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it would take voter approval to pull money out of that capital reserve fund to cover those health care costs or to put it into facilities, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? So best case scenario, we put the 250 in, we budgeted enough for our health care costs, and now we have 250 on top of the 600 that the voters put in last year to put toward our $2 million locker room project that we know is coming or some other facility need that will forever keep coming. Yep. Um, does the, oh gosh, let's see here. <laughs> uh, the second scenario where you apply 500, that still needs voter approval to apply that 500, correct? correct? Yeah. So in the, we just finished the, the warning and the ballot for, for the board approval next week. And so there's an, there's an, there, you're actually gonna have two. One, the one that's gonna be embedded in the, um, that is embedded in the agenda for next week has an article that says, shall the voters approve um, depositing 250,000 into that reserve fund. So it does take voter approval to put it in and it takes voter approval to take it out. And the understanding is if that, if that article fails, that that 250,000 <coughs> goes to offset taxes. Patrick, um, I'm late, so sorry for being late, but um, the new status for um, certain employees being full-time if they're 17 and a half hours or more has 
that increase to their health insurance been incorporated into your budget? Yeah, there, there are two the ones things, that you know of. Right. Outside of the HRA and the premium um, changes that happened in that settlement, there are two other things that had a potential impact that didn't impact us a lot. One is the requirement that anyone who works 17 and a half hours is now eligible. Um, <laughs> We, de we define full time as 37 and a half hours, uh, or 35, uh, 35 and a half hours. Yeah. 30. In any event, that didn't impact us because we already offer insurance to people that work at that level. So that's already mitigated for us. In addition, um, in some places, paraprofessional support staff haven't been offered access to all plans that are covered by insurance. And the settlement says that they have to be made available to everyone. We've always been offering all plans to everyone, so that doesn't impact us either. So I want to talk a little bit about the tax rates. So this sort of shows, and I'll just kind of go quickly over this because the actual dollar <coughs> impact is on the next slide. So again, this is the scenario where we use all 750. And it shows you sort of how those, what's happening here. This is the Act 46 adjustment. So the first year we were uh, unified, we got an eight cent tax reduction. The second year, a six cent tax reduction. And this year that we're, we're building, a four cent tax reduction. Great in that it's a tax reduction. The downside is when it was six and now it's four, you feel the pinch of having two fewer cents that it was reduced by. So that, that factors in. But really what people want to know is, so how many dollars are we talking? And that's what this slide is intended to show. The, this, this um, using full 750, the percent increase on the tax rates, two and a half to four and a half percent. The, the other one is about a three and a half to five and a half percent increase. So depending on the scenario, it's about a 1% difference on the tax rate for a town. So this is how many dollars per 100,000 of assessed value a person in each of those towns uh, could expect to pay more than what they're paying now. Could you just remind us, Patrick, of last year's percent increase? Because if I'm not mistaken, it was like double what we're. Right. I couldn't. I can't tell you off the top of my head what it was for sure, but it was definitely higher because again, we were eight point something percent increase per equalized pupil last year versus three and a half or four and a half or thereabouts in what you're looking at this time. So it was definitely higher a greater increase last year than what we're projecting for this year. In either scenario. Correct. I'd have to verify to really be 100% certain and to really dial into what the change was, mm -hmm. but I understand it, I think, as you're understanding it. So again, this is, this is what an individual or a, or a family might expect to pay in an increase in taxes if they're paying for the full value of their home, which again, two-thirds of Vermonters don't. Two-thirds of Vermonters pay based on income, one-third pay based on the value of their home. Um, and if we look at the same slide, we can see what that increases there. It's about a 1% difference comparing the two. So the next piece there has a, a, a lot of information in it. Um, and all of the all of the do, the document you have there with all the lines that show the summary page and all the details in those various categories are not highlighted on the screen. Um, but we can hit, there's a lot of notes in there that explain some of the things that might raise question about in terms of a more significant percent increase or dollar increase that kind of catch your attention. So we've included notes that explain those. Happy to answer any questions about specific lines that you're seeing. Um, and knowing that some folks are going to need to go, I want to also just show you that the, the last several pages of your packet is an attempt to make a, a connection between each of those sections that you see the detail on with a little description of what's in there. If you can somehow, sometimes you can tell, and other times it's a little harder to tell. So this is an attempt to try and help you understand what that is. And then to show how does that section, which contains these things, connect to the community values that we, we learned about this fall? And how does that connect to the strategic goals and the strategic plan? To sort of link our spending with community values with our plan. And there's a few pages of those. So having said that, happy to answer any questions about 
the lines um, or the connection between spending and those two other areas. Yes. Thank you for this slide. This is awesome. Yeah. Tammy, Tammy Crossman. When we hired her this past year as one of the accounts, and she <coughs> was spectacular. This is really great. I'll take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> but but <laughs> if you have the pleasure of meeting Tammy, thank you. Okay. She worked really hard on this. There was some conversation about um, out of the central office, if you pay a fee per, per month, per year to be there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> A little north of 50,000. 50, okay, yeah. so something around there. And, yep. you know, that doesn't change our whole budget, but, you know, that's significant at these, at these times. So um, I know in a couple small groups, people are playing around with that. I know people, so I just wonder, has that, I might not be in here, but is that, where is that conversation going? Because I imagine um, having a central office be in the school that's not being used would be yep. really, might have some barriers, but also could be really cool in a lot of ways besides saving money. So it's not just money. So where is yeah. that conversation? But, and for me, when I think about it from the lens of saving money, so I, I agree, we, we shouldn't, as a long-term plan, continue to pay rent in the space when we have lots of space available to us, given fewer classrooms utilized for instruction, et cetera. Having said that, in the absence of a long-term picture of what's going on with our facilities, we run the risk of, I guess, wasting money. We've done some, we've conducted some studies, we've paid architects to actually give us figures on what it would cost to upfit a couple of different spaces to, to move central office into one of our buildings. So we looked at, there's a, there's a small building on the corner of the campus here, like sort of turned into the parking lots at Mount A. We looked at a, a renovation of that building to be suitable for central office space in terms of the need and file storage, all the things that sort of come along with that space. That was about $2 million to upfit. We also looked at putting a second story on sort of the wing furthest to the south, I guess it is here at Mount Abe, which is, it's known as the middle school wing. It's not just middle school that happens there, but sort of the new wing that has a few different names. That was gonna be about two and a quarter million dollars to upfit. So wh where I go with that is, I'm now perhaps painfully aware of the cost to move central office into any one of our spaces. And though it would save us forty or fifty thousand dollars a year in rent, I don't want to spend that kind of money without knowing what's our long-term plan for our use of our facilities. And that kind of puts us in this this challenging place. Also, because I think next October or the fall, maybe the following October, our lease is up on our ten-year lease with our building that we're in now. There seems to be some interest in the in the landowners. Uh, sort of willingness to extend that lease by a year or two or to sort of work with us because they live in the town, they're taxpayers, et cetera, and kind of know where we find ourselves. Um, but it makes it difficult to make long-term plans for our central office space when we don't know what the long-term plans are for facilities. Kristen, you had your hand up. I was just going to say we have a retreat on Saturday where we're going to talk about um, uh, steps forward, so anyone that wants to come to that can do that. It's 8.30 to 3.30 here in the same lovely room that we're in now. I also want to add a perspective that, I mean, I think in month, month in, taxes for 100000 on the proposed budget are going to go about $39 a year, right, wherever that is. And I just want to say that here's another town's thought about things. In South Burlington, the bond they're going to have on rebuilding their middle school and high school, they're asking people over 30 or 35 years on 100,000 property to pay $428 a year on 100,000. So as we scrounge for crumbs, I don't know if this is going to pass, I kind of doubt it, but that's how some other towns are looking at it. And I, part of my job is to work at three of those elementary schools um, one day a week, and I was at one one day the amount of building of apartments going up there. The school um, absorbed nine more students at the turn of the year because a new apartment building opened up. So that's nine students, which would impact one of our schools tremendously by, yay, we get more money. But So that's where the growth is happening. A bunch of studies have come out in the last month or two about how in America people are moving urban 
tremendously. And if we look at, I mean, what did our percentage of in Vermont went down in the last 10 years? So that's where people are moving, and that's where buildings are being built. So that was, I'm just saying there are other buildings in South Burlington going up. Those schools are like, oh my god, we're not going to have enough room, right? But I, I doubt. Send them to us. Right. Well, I think for many reasons, you know, I mean, that's that's just not the trend in the country in general, no matter what we do. So. Yeah, just to follow that though, I mean, certainly some parts of the uh, state would grow, and I think we are close enough to the Burlington area that we will not drop forever. I think we will. I mean, more construction is still happening in our towns in a small fashion. So I, I do think it will spread out enough that at least we level off and you know, I don't think the 2024 number or whatever year it was will actually go that well. I actually think we've probably already bottomed. But we'll <coughs> see, maybe not. I hope you're right. <laughs> so also worth noting, this isn't your last chance to ask questions about all the lines that you have, right? So that you have this information now well in advance of the annual meeting, which is another opportunity to sort of dig into some of those lines. Um, our, our intent was to get you this information ahead of time, or at least to make it available ahead of time. As budgets sometimes do, numbers kept going in and kept fluctuating, and we had to keep responding, so we couldn't, we couldn't get you something that we felt solid enough and accurate enough ahead of time, so I apologize for that. But also, I would say, happy again to stay after, and if you really want to dig deep, Call up, make an appointment with me, maybe Floyd. Uh, we're happy to go. 1,800 lines you could look at if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, have, have to dig as deep as you want or try to respond to, to questions you have about the budget in any way that works. Dr. Gridge, just one thing. Uh, the, it looks like this year, for maybe the first time in a while, we're going to um, adequately fund the food service budget to yeah. keep from running the normal deficit every year? Yeah, that's just sort of a reality of recognizing for several years now, so to first set the context, so we, our, our food service program isn't really self-sufficient. It requires support from the general fund to make it sort of financially viable. And so that happens in two ways, or at least it has happened in a couple of ways over, over the years. There's a, a general fund contribution that is budgeted to support the food service program. It's historically been about $195,000. In addition, um, there, there's, there's essentially every year, despite lots of effort, there are un, there's uncollected debt. Students that eat meals and don't pay for them and aren't eligible <coughs> for free meals. We've taken the approach for years. It's been consistent. I think it's the right approach. We feed kids. We're not going to give you a peanut butter sandwich because you don't have any money on your account while everyone else is eating whatever it is that day. We're going to give you the same meal everyone else gets, and we're not going to shame you. We're not going to tell you that you can't eat. And that comes at a cost. Those, those dollars, that uncollected debt at the end of the year, has historically come out of whatever we have for a fund balance at the end of the year, and we sort of make that right at the end of the year. This is not banking on a fund balance to do that. This is putting up front in the general fund some money to anticipate that that we've seen every year. So it, it sort of sort of puts our money where our mouth is in that we're going to make sure that we're feeding kids. So I guess the point I wanted to make was that's probably, aside from inflation, not going to be an increase we would see every year. It's sort of a one-time <coughs> Right, aside from inflation, yes. So that is a factor in something that drove up the, the cost in the budget. I'll take your silence as if I have a question, I'll go find Patrick at the end of this thing, or I'll schedule a time to go talk with Patrick or Floyd. And with that, I'll turn it over to Don. All right, so board members, the last thing we have to do is to adjourn. So I need a motion to adjourn. So move. Move. <laughs> Second. Sarah and Andrew <laughs> at 7.